passage of scripture I'd like to read for you and then meditate on this Monday, Thursday evening is Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 25. Hear God's word. And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him, one after another, is it I? He said to them, it is one of the 12, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. This is the word of God. Let's pray together. Lord, what a blessing it is that you have spoken to us. We pray that you'd help us by the Holy Spirit to take in the truth of your word and to be brought closer to Jesus by that hearing. So we pray it in his name. Amen. Well, there's three wonderful truths I'd like us to consider as we look at this passage and gather around the Lord's table this evening. The first is the Lordship of Jesus. Why the detail in this narrative, do you think, about where the Passover would be eaten and the preparation for that meal. There is a strangeness to this story. Jesus sends two of his followers into the city and tells them, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. When they see the man, they follow him to his house, and as he enters, they present themselves with what is a pretty outrageous demand. Imagine if you got home from carrying some water and someone approached you and said, where will the teacher eat the Passover meal? It's interesting to see commentators on this passage struggle with trying to figure out what's going on here. Some say that it must be that Jesus had prearranged this Obviously, it would be just too weird to hear such a demand from a stranger. Well, if that's the 
the case, though, what about the timing? Go into the city and you will find a man carrying water. Now, I imagine that carrying water is something that only happened, I don't know, for maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes or so. You would need, wouldn't you, a cell phone, a couple of them, to coordinate this if it was all prearranged. Well, there's another answer to this. And I agree with those who say this is making the point of Jesus' sovereignty over all things. He has what the great Dutch preacher and theologian and a hero of World War II, Klaus Skilder, called the sovereign rights of requisition. That is, he is a king who could demand anything the property of any person for his own use. Now, this is key to grasping what the Lord's Supper is all about. Jesus was not a helpless victim. Jesus was the Lord of all. He has the right to all the property that is owned and controlled by all the people in this world he has the right to demand that every person who lives follow him as their Lord and God. A monumental demand. There's another thing that's striking about this. When you make such a demand upon a person that I'm considering was a stranger carrying water, why would he ever submit to that demand? And the reason for that, I believe, is that God's word is, and students at Westminster get an insight into this, self-authenticating. When God gives the word, there is no higher authority than that word itself. And that word was delivered to the man gathering water. And it carried its own authority with it. And lo and behold, he submitted. And there the Passover was eaten. And this tells us that Jesus had no needs. He was the self-sufficient son of God. He didn't need our worship or our praise. The reason he was giving himself up is out of sheer love, no other reason. Now, you and I are meant, are created to replicate in some way this attribute of God of love. I mean, take, take your pastors for an example. We are charged to tend the flock of God willingly, doing it because we love to do it. And yet, it's true, we're paid to do it. And there's an element at which sometimes you do things because it's your job and you're paid to show up. Sometimes you're not feeling all that pastoral and all that loving. It's just a reality. We're called to love the people of God, and there is a sense in which God makes us new and makes us love his people. But even in loving the people of God, you have to admit at times that you love them and they love you back, and that makes you feel good. You get something out of it. I'm making the point that you and I, we are not self-sufficient the way Jesus was and is to this day. The glorious thing about it, about his lordship, is he loved us without getting anything in return. His love is giving from start to finish, and that means you can rely on it. It has no limits. Now, the second thing, Jesus and his closeness to his disciples, taking them into his confidence about the betrayal. He was deeply troubled 
This was the time when he steadily descends into hell. That is the abandonment by God due to the curse of sin. And as the Gospels describe, especially Holy Week, it's best to see it as a progressively unfolding story of steady descent by degree after degree into hell itself. One of the most painful aspects of Jesus suffering in his soul, in a sense, what kicks it off is for one of the 12 to betray him. It's bad enough to have faceless writers bashing you on social media, for example. People these days can get very upset when these kinds of fights break out between anonymous writers and opinion makers on social media. But what if someone you had invested your life in, someone that you had enjoyed sweet fellowship with, someone who you felt was near your heart, what if that person turns on you in the cruelest way to give you up to arrest and torture? What if one of your closest companions did that to you? Jesus is reflecting to his disciples and taking them in to this scene of trouble in his life because this is what God the Lord does. He reveals himself to us. He takes us in to his own life. Jesus does this. And with these words, he takes them into even what you could call the mind of God. One of you will betray me. One who is eating with me. We read that they were troubled by this and began to question themselves. I think this might be the high point for the disciples in the record of their life with Jesus, at least before his resurrection, and they're carrying on the work of the church. I think this is a high point for the disciples, that they each look at themselves and say, is it me? They were all doubting themselves and willing to have the truth about themselves revealed. And that's when Jesus reflects on an awesome theological reality here. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. All the scriptures have their focus on the death of the Son of God on behalf of sinners to make atonement. This is predetermined. This is something in the decrees, the foreknowledge, the plan of God. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But yet there is human agency here in making this happen, and there's human responsibility. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. This one who must have caused great soul trouble to Jesus he reflects on with the terrible reality of his state as someone who's reprobate, who is going to be punished and held to account for this crime of the ages, betraying the Son of Man with a kiss. So we remember Jesus as the Lord who opens his heart to us, we thirst, we hunger to know God. This is what we were made for. Eternity. God has put eternity in the hearts of men, Ecclesiastes says. We hunger and thirst for the knowledge of God, and this is what he imparts to us. This is a picture of Jesus taking his disciples into close communion with him. This is life itself. This is what had been lost in the fall. And this is what Jesus restores to us. Communion with the living God. And then finally, his grace. 
giving them signs of his costly sacrifice. The final point is Jesus giving the disciples and all those who will believe on him through their ministry that continues down through the ages because of their written attestation of what they had seen and heard. He gave them, in place of the Passover, something brand new for the Christian church, the Lord's Supper. Broken bread and poured wine are signs of the new covenant. The new covenant is the reissuing of God's solemn promise to give himself to us as God and to take us to himself as his people. The covenant binds us together in a relationship with love. The closest analogy to it is the love of a husband for his wife. The union of two people in a one flesh relationship is modeled on the covenant of grace of Christ's love for his church. There is good news about this sacrament. The value of it does not depend on the elements as there was something, as if there was something magical in themselves or any virtue in him who administers them. No, it's not as though the ministers of the gospel are guru-like in their quality to dispense blessing. No, it's not that at all. It comes from the blessing of Christ and the working of his spirit in those who by faith receive the supper. That's good news. It doesn't depend on the elements. It doesn't depend on those who serve them. It depends on Christ who loves to bless his people and who administers the spirit to them. Now, you may think that the promise that this passage ends with is for the far off future. I will not again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in the kingdom of God. It wouldn't be entirely inappropriate to think that there's a reference to the new heavens and the new earth and the final marriage supper of the Lamb. But there's another way to take it, and that is that when Jesus rises from the dead, the newness of the kingdom will break into the world. And by the church coming together in the presence of its Lord and remembering him in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, Jesus himself will be gathering with his people by his spirit and will be drinking the fruit of the vine with those disciples as they celebrate the Lord's Supper. So we gather together tonight with one another, and that's a wonderful thing. It's wonderful to see one another and to be with one another. But even beyond that, the wonder of this is that Jesus meets with us. We remember him tonight. And one of the best memories is his promise to be with us always. We believe he meets with us in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And that is good news. Let's pray. Our Lord, we thank you for your lordship over all things. We thank you for the close fellowship that you bring us into. We thank you for your grace poured out upon us, unmerited favor, blessing that we can depend on because it comes from you, the God who cannot lie. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.